Amen. Amen. Over to you, mate. Right, thank you, Andy. Well, there's two things that I want to get across, but I'll reiterate that at the end. So I'm going to talk about my Christian walk and how I've come to where I've got to. And there's been many times in my Christian walk where I've been searching for answers and not getting them, becoming frustrated, wondering how parts of the Word of God apply to me, especially as a young man. Uh, and as a child, not really understanding how it applied to me. And I can remember being at secondary school, a uh, 12-year-old, and they gave us all a Gideon's Bible. And in the back of this Bible was a list of problems and the verses that were the solutions. And I can remember looking them up and no help whatsoever. But in my teens, I wanted fun. I wanted to play football. I wanted to see what was out there in the world. I always had faith, never lost it. I can't remember a time when I didn't believe in the Lord. So I've been going to Bush for about six years now, but about eight years ago, I couldn't stop thinking about the Lord, the gospel, creation, Father God. I just, all day long, just constantly thinking about it. And I thought, I don't know the God I profess a belief in. I don't know him. So I remember the time when I was a child, I think I was about six years old, and I heard the audible voice of God. Uh, he woke me up. I was asleep. And he said my name. Um, and I started waking up. The second time he said my name, I was almost awake. And the third time he said my name, I was awake. And obviously I was a little bit confused. So I can remember shouting out, my mum coming in my room and saying, uh, did you call me? And mum said no. And I said, oh, it must have been God then. And just rolled over and went back to sleep. Well, the following morning, I woke up and obviously remembered what had happened. And I couldn't remember, I could remember the, the voice because it was so complete. It was, I heard it from outside of me and I heard it from within me. It was the most complete thing I'd ever heard. So anyway, back to eight years ago and all I'm thinking about is the Lord and I'm thinking I'm going to have to get to a church. And this one particular day, I'd come back from work and I was sat at home. I'd got showered off, I got a cup of coffee and I sat down on the sofa. And I was just sat watching TV. And then the next minute, someone came up behind me and put the biggest, thickest, warmest blanket around me. And from a seating position, I must have leapt about three metres forward. And I turned round and the sofa's up against the wall. So there's no, no one, nothing behind me. So... I'm there scratching my head thinking, well, what's going on here? Anyway, that weekend uh, I went down to see my mother and I was telling my mum about it. Um, my mum walked out and I was saying, I just don't know what it is. I says, what on earth was that? And my mum walked out the room and out of the TV came the words, a hug from Jesus. Uh, okay, um, I think I better start taking this a lot more seriously now. So then I came to bushfire shortly afterwards and my adult Christian walk began. The first thing I learned was to meditate on the word. That if something stands out to you, don't just breeze past it. Think about it, pray about it. And the first thing that stood out to me was Jesus flipping over the, the tables in the outer courts of the temple. For some reason, this just stood out to me. It did not seemed to fit in with anything else. So I, why, why is this here? I, it just didn't make any sense. So I did what I'd learnt here, prayed about it, thought about it, meditated on it. And a, a few days later, a different perspective came to me. And I thought, if I went to my earthly father's house and I saw an absolute abomination going on to him that he would hate, would I do something about it? Would I stop it? Absolutely, I'd stop it. And I thought, why? It's because I know him. Because I'm in relationship with him. That's why I'd stop it. And it's the same with God. It's 
that's where the deeper love is. It's knowing him and it's being in a relationship with him. So the Lord's blessed me with many things, with dreams, uh, people coming with words of knowledge for me, experiences and revelation. And I found that I was being more and more impacted by the word of God, more and more. And when I read this verse, I'll never forget it. It was like a hand came out of the Bible and slapped me. Now, pay attention to this. And it's John 14, verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. I couldn't believe that. The only way I can explain it is I was fearful and excited at the same time. It just, it just absolutely blew my mind because I thought, hang on a minute, if I get this right, you're going to start showing up and manifesting in my life. I couldn't believe it. So then I read James, James 1, verse 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only. No, no, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this one will be blessed in what he does. So I started taking words a lot more seriously. And in Matthew 12, 36 and 37, this one sent a bit of a shiver down my spine as well. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give you an account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. And I started to understand just what a power our words had. Just what a creative power we can create something positive or negative with it. You give someone a compliment, you can lift them up, you can make them happy, you can change the day. Or if you insult them, you can ruin the day, you can wreck them. Um, so, so yeah, so um, when I started taking words more seriously, then God's word could start doing a work in me. So the biggest battle I've had, I've got to say, well, for, for a start, sorry. I started, as I paid more attention to my words, I started paying attention to all words. My words, the word of God, words other people were saying. And how important it is to be truthful and the amount of lies we tell each other. And we, and we give them these harmless little names like, oh, it's just a white lie. Well, what happens is when we excuse it, we all end up going around lying to each other. And when you find out the truth, you're more hurt than if you just told them the truth in the first place. So, because we do all sorts. We, we excuse it so we don't hurt people's feelings. And the end result is far worse than if in the first place we just told them the truth. So, one bad habit I had was swearing. I've always worked in a male-dominated environment. So I then had to rein in the swearing and that wasn't as difficult as I thought it was going to be until I stood up into a corner at kitchen cupboard then there was nothing godly left my mouth then however I'm working on that so the next issue I had and I think this is a real issue for everyone is the mind as soon as I started to rein in the mind the thoughts that came into my head were disgusting, shameful, embarrassing. Things I wouldn't tell anybody for the shame and embarrassment that they went through my head. Uh, now I wouldn't tell them because I don't want to put them in someone else's head. That, that's the truth of it. So I was thinking about this battle with the mind and, and where it comes from. And it was when I was reading Legion that... <laughs> Excuse me, while well, I just read out Legion. This is Mark 5, the, from verse 1. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him, out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit, 
who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him, and always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the high God? I am pure, pure, sorry, I imp implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also, he begged him earnestly that he would not send him them out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine, that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000 pigs. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine fled. And they told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon possessed and had the legion sitting and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind and they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. Right? Now, if we look at the actions of this man, there's nakedness, unruliness, self harm, self loathing, depression unwilling to be restrained no, restrained, no acceptance of authority and violence. Now, how many of these issues do we see in the world today? So, and where is he living? He's living in a graveyard. So, the enemy's plans are to separate us, to cut us off. And he starts by doing this mentally. And then he gets us self-harming. It gets, it's to cut us off mentally and to get us doing it to ourselves, you know. So, he attacks our mind. Um, and when we allow sin to manifest in our lives, there are no chains man can make um, that can restrain it. So, I mean, how many times have we heard... Someone's committed suicide and everyone's saying, I never realised they were that bad. I never realised they're in that place. It's because they've been cut off. They've been isolated and separated. And that's what his plan is to do to us. is to attack your mind to cut you off. So he wants to cause self-hate, self-harm, self-mutilation. He was cutting himself with stones, feeling of worthy, of no value, ashamed, embarrassed, Beyond help, no good can come from me. Everyone's better off without me. That's his plan. So why did Jesus allow the demons to go into the pigs? Well, I think it was so he could see. What he was dealing with was real. It was harmful, and it was a lot. And it was destructive, and it was actually trying to kill him. Um, he was living in a graveyard, mentally and physically. So, something else struck me. In verse 2 it says, And when he came out of the boat, immediately there met him, out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. Now, these spirits called themselves legion. That's about 6,000. So he had about 6,000 demons. And immediately, Jesus goes running up to him. Now those demons, the last person they want to be close to is Jesus. That must have taken some strength from him to go running up to Jesus at that point because all those demons will have been kicking and screaming and doing everything they could to stop him getting to Jesus. So I think 
he wanted to be clean. And I think it's something that's within us that we want to be clean. And I think that that will to, to live a clean life, to get rid of the filth, I think that was a very powerful drive for him. That's why he could overcome the demons that were working on him to get to the Lord. So he begged Jesus to go with him, but Jesus didn't let him. Um, he said, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. So if you notice, Jesus, on, when he was on the other side of the sea, he was with everyone, all his disciples, all followers, all people, and he left the flock to cross the sea for the one lost sheep. So, yeah, so, uh, and even though the townspeople didn't ask Jesus to leave, they didn't want him to know, Jesus did not give up on them. He sent them an evangelist, the man he'd just saved. So, why didn't Jesus let him go with him? Well, I think it was because when they met again in heaven, Jesus could give him more because of his obedience. He could say, well done, good and faithful servant. So, continue with the mind. I then read, Matthew, well, Matthew 6.33 stood out to me. But first, seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So I went after righteousness and failed. Um, and besides all the things that were coming into my mind, I started having a really good look at myself and really, really paying close attention to the word to look for, for the answers. And I realized I wasn't protecting my eyes and my ears um, from the world. I was still allowing things in. And some of the issues I was dealing with in my mind were a consequence of what I'd allowed through my eyes or my ears. Um, so it was all right, 2 Corinthians 10.5, saying take every thought captive. But I found out I was actually feeding the problem. So I understood that I could not live in this world the way I was doing and have the relationship with Jesus that I wanted. So, 1 Thessalonians 4.3 says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. And verse 7, it says, For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. So, I started recognizing that if I wanted to be transformed by the renewing of my mind, I had to sanctify myself. I had to start coming out of the world. Um, you know, because it's all right daily examining yourself and taking every thought captive, but you've got to come out of the world so because you can't clean up your mind if you're polluting it at the same time. And taking control of my eyes, my ears, my tongue was became central to my Christian walk. In Luke three verse eight it says, Prove by the way that prove by the way that you live that you have repented of your sins. And um I don't think I'll be able to make the progress I have without sanctification. It's been a massive, massive key for me. And I'm not saying I'm there. I'm saying I'm on my way. And it, it's one thing that has made a massive difference in my Christian walk. Another issue I had to deal with was the past. How the enemy likes to remind us of what we've done in the past. I'd, I'd be driving car or in shower or making some food and I'd be perfectly happy, perfectly at peace and then next minute this memory comes into my head and I'm there going, oh, I did that or I said that. So I started discerning where these things were coming from because if I'm not choosing to think about, about it, where are they coming from? You're in control of your mind, so where are they coming from? They're being given to you to try and pull you down by the enemy. It's it's uh, something you've got to recognize so you don't end up plummeting. And this, Luke 9, verse 62. No one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. That's, that's quite a harsh warning. 
That is, you know, no one is, if you look back, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. Now, when I was struggling with the past, I was thinking, well, yeah, but I'm, I'm being repentant here, I, I, you know. But no one looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now, when they were plowing in those times, in the left hand, they'd have the reins of the oxen. And in the right hand, they'd have the plow. And it was an awkward, bumpy job. And if they didn't look straight ahead all the time, the moment they looked away, they immediately went off course. So Jesus is warning us here, forget the past, just look forward. Because Jesus came to save us from the choices we made without him. That's why he died on the cross. And when I realized that, I could, uh, I accepted what he'd done for me. And um, I, could, I could move forward a lot stronger. So, Paul writes in Philippians 3, verses 13 and 14. But I focus on one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Now, one thing that didn't help while I was trying to get over the past was hearing that it's unbelief. That, that, that didn't help. But, like I say, it was that moment when I realised that's what the cross is all about. It's about the choices we made without him. Um, but he, saves, he saved us from them. So, how does God deal with unbelief? If we go to Mark 6, verse 5, um, it says, and this, this always stood out to me. This was something else that really stood out to me. This was a real head scratcher for a long time for me. And because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. That really, I, I was like thinking, this is when Jesus has gone back to his hometown, Nazareth. He couldn't do any miracles. So if you go to verses 2 and 3, says, the next Sabbath, he begins teaching in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. They asked, where did he get all this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? Then they scoffed, he's just a carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. And his sisters live right here among us. They were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. I'm reading this out of the NLT. So... Miracles, healings, they're all done by the Holy Spirit, right? So why would they have condemned themselves if Jesus had done any more miracles? Because they didn't believe Jesus was from God. They'd have put it down to something else. And in doing so, if Jesus had performed more miracles and healings, they would have ended up condemning themselves. So instead of allowing that to happen, God was patient. He waited. And that's why he couldn't do any more miracles there. So, so what do we do when we're struggling with thoughts in the past? Well, the answer is in Philippians 4.8. Fix your thoughts on what is true, honourable, right, pure, and lovely, and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and are worthy of praise. Now, I think the easiest thing to think of is scripture and it's the daily food we need from reading scripture that keeps our mind my mind on the right track if I get lazy I notice things start creeping back in so Isaiah 20, 26 3 says you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you so as I was um, sanctifying myself and learning, getting deeper into the word and really paying attention to the word, I was finding myself winning the battle, so to speak. Not completely clear of it, but making far more progress than I ever had done before. So the, my problem is procrastinating. So I'll say, right, I'll start reading at six and then it'll be five past six, and I think, well, I'll leave it till half past. And then it gets to 20 to seven, and I think I'll do it at seven. And, yeah, so 
I found this very useful uh, in wondering why I act this way, and it's Romans 7.15. For I do not understand what I am doing, for I am not practicing what I want to do, but I do the very thing I hate. And in verse 18 it says, For the willing is present in me, but the doing of good is not. And in verse 23 it says, But I see a different law in the parts of my body, waging war against the law of my mind. So, right, so, now as I'm battling with my mind, I'm also battling with my flesh as well. Now, so how do I now combat that? So, get stuck into the word. So now here's something everybody loves, fasting. Yes, so what does fasting do? Humbles the soul and the flesh by not allowing them to dictate to us. It brings, brings us closer to God. Um, if we look at the fast in the Bible, we've got Ezra for safe passage. Jonah and Esther to avert disaster. In Jonah, when he was at Nineveh, even the animals fasted. Um, in Acts 13 and 14, uh, Paul uh, it was they were fasting to know God's mind and Jesus says when you fast not if you fast you know we all accept straight away prayer is essential but when I started listening to the word really paying attention so he's fasting and we've been struggling I've been struggling for longer than I should have been really if I'd just paid close attention closer attention to the word and did what I don't want to do so it got me thinking right did, did the disciples fast and you know the how can they fast while the bridegroom is with them well the Jews at that time unless it was for the fest, religious festivals they generally fasted for the coming of the Messiah and the Messiah was with them so how can they fast while the bridegroom is with them? That makes sense. Well, I read this. Mark 2, verse 18. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and on that day they will fast. So, then I read this. Mark 9, 17 and 18. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son, who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. So Jesus ends up driving out the spirit. And the disciples ask him, why couldn't we do it? And Jesus says, this kind can only come out, can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. So the fasting brings a closeness to God. And closeness to God brings authority. And that's, for me, that's what it says to me. That is, Jesus was very close to his father but the disciples were just learning how to get really close to Jesus and Father God so it, a good example of just how much fasting can do for us is Ahab in first Kings is described as no one else so completely sold himself to what was evil in the Lord's sight as Ahab did so the Lord sent Elijah with a message for Ahab. And the message was, I'm going to destroy you and all your male descendants in Israel. Um, I've had enough of you, basically. Uh, I'm going to destroy you all. So when Ahab heard this, he fasted in sackcloth and ashes. And the Lord sent Elijah back to him. This is 1 Kings 21, verse 28. Then another message from the Lord came to Elijah. Do you not see how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has done this, I will not do what I promised during his lifetime. Now, 
if fasting can do that to the most evil king of Is- can do that for the most evil king of Israel, what can it do for us? That, that it's just yeah that God really pays attention to fasting. This is really important, and I came across this, and I'm sure I've heard Andy say this before. I've heard a few people say it. But I personally can can testify that this is completely true because there's moments when I've not carried on fasting like I should have done and I have backslid. Uh, But John Wesley in his journal wrote, I am persuaded that if a Christian has understood the need to fast and does not practice fasting, he will backslide just as surely as a Christian who has understood the need to pray and does not pray. I can personally testify that that is true. Um, You know, Jesus, when he was in the desert for 40 days and he was tested by Satan, um, getting closer to his father at the same time, he was fasting. Uh, Everything Jesus did is an example to us. So, as I'm going towards the end now, um, there's two things I'd like people to, to take away from this. That is, anyone that's struggling with the past... Jesus came to save us from the choices we made without him and the importance of sanctification and fasting. And I'll, uh, I'll end with this. Um, and it's something I've thought about before, um, but it was a question, Alex, is it Adami, Adem, Adami? It was Adem. It was uh, something, a, a question, Uh, Alex posed, why didn't Father God just give Jesus a ready-made bride? And for me, I think it's because there's some things we want ready-made. We want food, a drive through a restaurant. You don't want to go in the kitchen and make it yourself. You want it ready-made. You want a coffee table for your lounge. You want it ready-made. But with other things, it's the time, the work, the effort, the thought, the focus, and the love that make it precious, that make it worth having. Uh, Jesus wants to be chosen. He wants to be loved. He wants to be chosen, like we are. Um, So it's like a child doing a painting for mum or dad. Um, Yeah, they make a mess. It's quite astonishing, the mess they can make. Um, But... It's the time, the work, the effort, the thought, the focus, and the love that makes that picture so so precious, so special. So, like a child doing, making a mess, you know, doing a picture. It's it's kind of like our Christian walk. Sometimes we'll make a mess, but just put your heart into it. So, thank you for listening. Good tool, wasn't it?